Hello, you're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Before I begin this episode proper, I'd like to read a passage by the Roman historian Arian. Quote, Alexander then drew up his troops until the phalanx was 120 ranks deep. He ordered the hoplites to hold their spears upright, then turned their massed spears now to the right, now to the left. He marched the phalanx briskly forwards, leading it in a zigzag manner, first towards one wing, then towards the other. After thus drawing up several formations and rearranging them at brief intervals, the enemy troops had long marveled as they watched the crisp, orderly movements of the men being drilled, and when the attack came, the Talantians hastened back to the city. This passage, above all else, demonstrates the supreme discipline and professionalism of the Macedonian army under the reigns of Alexander and Philip. This is the army that will conquer much of the world under Alexander, and will form the bedrock of the Hellenistic armies for the next 150 years until the arrival of the Roman legions. This is the famed Macedonian phalanx. But what exactly is a Macedonian phalanx? What makes it different from a regular non-Macedonian phalanx? What's a phalanx in general? To clarify, I need to give a bit of background information. Phalanx was a system of fighting, developing likely in the 6th century BC, which involved warrior citizens of the cities, known as hoplites, armed with large circular shields and a spear to form up in rank and effectively create a wall of bristling spines, each interlocking with a man next to them. By engaging in this closed rank, the army served as one solid unit. Now, the notion of a shield wall with spears was not strictly a Greek practice, being attested to in Egyptian and Near Eastern depictions of combat, but the Greeks managed to specialize in it. The Spartans famously were supremely adept at the phalanx, being unique for their incredible discipline and their training year-round for war. The invasion Persians in the 490s and 480s BC learned how effective this maneuver really was, with stunning results at Marathon and Plataea. Greek mercenaries quickly became highly demanded specialists across the Mediterranean, from the Carthaginians of North Africa to, unsurprisingly, the Persian Empire. The Persians in particular began to become heavily dependent on the Greeks in order to win their victories, most famously shown during the reign of Artaxerxes II, who had to deal with his rebellious brother Cyrus the Younger and the army of Xenophon, who recorded his misadventures and victories in Persian territories in his Anabasis. Coming back to Macedonia, what exactly was different? Well, the armies of Macedonia before Philip were mainly foot soldiers and skirmishers. They were heavily supported by a rather talented cavalry force, which was restricted to the upper classes, given the tremendous expense to manage and equip multiple war horses. This remained relatively unchanged until Philip II, who, influenced by the Greek military professionalism of Thebes during his tenure as political hostage, took control of the Macedonian throne and enacted a reform of the fighting style of the army. The core build of the Macedonian phalanx was the Pesetairoi, or phalangite, a pike wielder who effectively replaced the hoplite. The phalangite was a moderately armored pikeman, wielding the mass of Sarissa, a pike of roughly 17 to 20 feet in length, tipped with a heavy iron spearhead, significantly longer than the typical spear used in hoplite formations. Given the length of the Sarissa, it drastically reduced the size of the shield they could, could carry, and the phalangite was effectively naked when it came to one-on-one -on -one combat, besides a small sword they had by their side. The phalanx, by its very nature, is not a formation designed for one-on-one -on -one combat, and Philip used this to his advantage. One typical block, or syntagma, of phalangites was 16 rows by 16 columns deep, much deeper than a typical Greek phalanx. The first four or five rows of men would have their services pointed straight forward, the next couple would have their pikes offset slightly upwards, and the last few would have theirs pointing directly above. This gradual shifting of the pikes was designed in order to prevent or reduce the impact of enemy missiles, such as javelins, arrows, or stones. In effect, the syntagma was a mobile porcupine, bristling with spear points at all directions that would make any close quarters infantry from getting too close without being skewered. One of the inherent weaknesses of the syntagma was its lack of mobility, and it thus became a target ripe for outmaneuvering and attacking from the unguarded back and sides, with noticeably grisly results when they encountered the Celts and later the Romans' manipular formations. Philip amended this issue in two key The first was the protection of the particularly vulnerable right flank, 
which was solved by the use of the Hypacipists, or Shield Bearers, a highly mobile infantry unit originally recruited from the most talented nobility of Macedonia to serve in special roles and missions, and be able to move among the Syntagma whenever they were needed. They were very disciplined, well decorated, and extremely loyal to their Basileos. The second, and other key component to the Macedonian phalanx, was their shock cavalry, the famous Hetairoi Companion Cavalry. The title of Companion refers to the origins of the riders, who were from the upper echelons of Macedonian society, and in particular, men who grew up and became part of the king's trusted inner circle. Wearing linen body armor called a lionel thorax, and equipped with a short sword and thrusting spear, the Companions were among the greatest cavalry in the ancient world, and are likely classified as the first shock cavalry, who were capable of charging directly into enemy formations, unlike prior cavalry forces in the ancient world, which were primarily used to harass and demoralize the enemy, or to chase after already, the fl already fleeing foes. The use of the cavalry and phalanx together was in the so-called hammer and anvil style. The phalanx was kept to hold and pin enemy troops, acting as an anvil, while the companions were the hammer, flanking and smashing their opponents. The Macedonian king would typically be at the forefront of the cavalry division, but Alexander brought it to a whole new level. He would frequently be at the head of his formations, purposefully visible for all to see, and would swoop in to deliver the decisive blow. This was perfectly captured on the famous Alexander mosaic recovered from Pompeii, showing Alexander gallantly charging towards Darius III and the Persian line at the Battle of Issus. While a near suicidal tactic, commanders both immediately after and throughout the centuries following Alexander would repeatedly attempt to ape his image with the decisive cavalry charge, sometimes with disastrous results, and even Alexander himself will nearly be killed several times throughout his roughly, recklessly brave acts. Alexander's army was also amply supported by the use of ranged troops, like javelin throwers or slingers. While pitched battles are the flashier and more sexy aspects of ancient combat, Alexander's army was no stranger to siege warfare. In the service to the army were talented engineers, who were involved in some of the most greatest sieges in antique history, such as the building of causeways across peninsulas like at the Siege of Tyre. They were also in possession of siege weaponry, such as heavy catapults and the primitive torsion-powered mounted crossbows. Alexander's force, on top of being well supplied and coordinated, could operate at astonishing speeds of marching well over 20 miles a day on average, a rate only ever matched in the ancient world by Julius Caesar himself. This dazzling speed often was the key to many of Alexander's victories, with some rebellious cities even opening up their gates after being shocked at the quick response of Alexander's troops. Their discipline in marching was carried over to their abilities in combat. I mentioned at the beginning of this episode the passage of Arian, reporting the drilling abilities of the Macedonian phalanx, which actually caused the Talantian tribe to submit due to the professionalism on display, and on numerous other occasions the phalangites managed to remain steadfast at the alien forces tossed at them, like scythe chariots of war, or war elephants. The use of elephants in Hellenistic warfare is actually an interesting subject, and I definitely would love to revisit it in a future episode. Many critics of Alexander have attempted to downplay much of his military genius, and argue that he was a rich kid handed the keys to an empire already established by Philip. Now, I think Philip was brilliant in his reforms, and was an essential part to Alexander's successes. But to downplay Alexander's role in expanding the capacity of the Macedonian military is short-sighted at best, and reactionary at worst. Alexander, in his campaigns that stretch some 10,000 miles across unfamiliar terrains of all types, managed to adjust and add the necessary parts to his army accordingly. The logistical system of provisioning and supplying an army greater than 48,000 men across the territory he traveled was no small feat. In addition, Alexander's army would grow from a strictly Macedonian one to more of an imperial style reminiscent of the Persians. Knowing full well of the limitations of his men, Alexander would gradually incorporate many new forces to supplement losses in manpower or overcome new challenges, such as employing steppe nomad horse archers or even substituting in Iranians into positions into the phalanx. Some have taken this as an attempt by Alexander to incorporate army in a form of a cultural unification or fusion. I can't say that this is outright false, 
but I consider Alexander to be more pragmatic about the benefits of additional manpower and tactical flexibility. After Alexander's death, the Macedonian phalanx remained the linchpin of Hellenistic warfare for the next 150 years. The professional troops of Macedonia would in some respects become little more than independent mercenaries for hire, commanding sizable political influence to the highest bidder in the wars of the Diadochoi. In some respects, the successor kingdoms often became too dependent on the phalanx to win victories, expanding and deepening the lines of the syntagma above all else. The Hellenistic commanders often failed to understand that Alexander's successes were not solely dependent on the size of the phalanx, or even the decisive cavalry charges, but many parts of a flexible army working in tandem to cover the weaknesses of each. The successor kingdoms would suffer terribly at the hands of the Roman manipular legions, but admittedly the level of flexibility of the legions is often too strongly overemphasized, but from the Battle of the Pydna in 168 BC, the phalanx began to melt away over time, and many of the remaining Hellenistic states focuses more on creating legionary type troops, and some, like the Seleucids, also place a growing emphasis on heavy armored cavalry. Still, the hammer and anvil of the phalanx and the companion cavalry will be the main tools that Alexander will use to conquer all those who stand against him. So, I'll have to leave it off on here. I apologize for the rather short episode, but I promise I'll make it up in the next one, where we can finally begin talking about Alexander's career proper. If you like this episode and want to see more, please consider subscribing to me on iTunes, or follow me on SoundCloud. You can also leave a review on iTunes, or if you want to get into contact, shoot me an email in the link provided. Until next time, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast.